Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed and I'd like to welcome you to KJV Bible Scope and we are on a Romans Overview series. We are on a part 134, 134 of the Romans Overview series and we are on the topic of wine and strong drink. And uh, we, we are dealing with a very controversial topic here. So um, there's going to be a lot of um, differences of opinions within people's minds. There's going to be a lot of differences of worldviews in people's minds. If you call yourself a Christian today, um, you're going to be challenged on this study of wine and strong drink. As the sayings go, Jesus turned the water into wine. And so people say they're justified to drink wine and strong drink. And we're going to cover those things as we did in the prior scopes. Um, Timothy took a little bit of wine for his stomach. What was he drinking Bacardi when he took a little bit of wine for his stomach? Was he drinking Old English 800 when he was taking a little bit of wine for his stomach for his infirmity's sake? Or, or was he drinking medicinal medicine for his stomach? Now, see, this is, these are the things that we have to cover in our study. And as you watch my prior scopes, we've already conquered most of these uh, contentions that people would want to make God unholy by saying that Jesus Christ was some kind of a bartender and he was turning the water into some, some wine coolers and then all the disciples had a drunken party. And that's not true, my friend. And as you go into the study with me and we'll dive into of this thing, what we will find is that there is no sanction in the Bible at all to even drink a little bit of wine in moderation. Now, when I say wine, I mean strong drink, okay? So let's go ahead and do this because I, I, I failed to do this on the last scope and I said I was going to put the chart on the screen for every single one of these wine studies, okay? So let's go ahead and throw the, the chart up right now, and let's have a look at the three definitions of wine in the Bible. So here it is. So there's the chart. I had made this a couple of days ago um, to match our wine study. And what we can see here is when people want to take wine in the Bible, the, most most of the time, I'm, I'm not saying everybody, there's a few out there that know their Bible and they know the differences between the wine. But there are many, many unlearned carnal Christians out there that are going out to the bars and they're thinking it's justified to drink fermented alcohol, okay? So what we're going to do today is get a little bit of understanding here and then actually expound on and continue on our prior studies, okay? So let's go ahead and get this chart out of the way first so we know where we stand as far as the different definitions of wine, okay? The first one, look to your left, all the way to the left, you'll see in the first little section there, miracle wine made from water. And that's called wine. And only Jesus made this wine, John chapter 2, verse 9. Okay, only Jesus made that wine. Nobody else could reproduce that wine. There is no water to wine factories in the world today. You are not going to go down to Walmart or you're not going to go down to the gas station. You're going to go down to the alcohol store and say, give me wine made from water. That wine does not exist today. This is a one-time event that was miraculous that Jesus was trying to show the world that whatever the world has to offer, what Jesus Christ offers is better. 
It's better than that wicked fermented wine. It's better than grape juice. Okay, now, now I know we're already diving into our other definitions here, but let's go to the second definition. Now, look at the middle part of the chart right here. It says fermented wine made from rotting fruit. Now that's broken off into three sections, as you can see on the screen. The first section of fermented wine is what we got as a representation of fermented wine is Jack Daniels. Now you could stick any fermented alcohol in there. You could stick wine coolers, Seagram's, uh, Bacardi, 40s, uh, Old English 800, whatever, whatever you want to stick there, okay? You can put any any fermented alcoholic beverage right there. I'm just using Jack Daniels as a representation, okay? So it's the Bible says, do not drink that strong drink. Now there's my verse, Leviticus 10.10. 10. That puts difference between holy and unholy. And if your argument is, well, that's just that's just a section just for the Old Testament priests. Well, we already covered that in the prior scopes in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 5. God has made us kings and priests unto himself when you were saved by the blood of the Lamb. Are you not a priest today? If you're saved today, you are a priest. You are a king unto God. And you are not to drink strong drink, my friend, to be, to be able to put difference between holy and unholy between clean and unclean so it's not well i can drink a little bit and it, and and i won't be violated no you are violated the moment you taste it you are not to drink one drink okay let's go to our let's go to our second little definition in the middle definition here of fermented wine made from rotting fruit now look at the look at the second one the, the right in this dead center of your screen you got a bottle of NyQuil right there, right? See that? It's medicine for the internal. So you take this internally, right? But for what reason? It's not just for leisure getting drunk as the world would define getting drunk, as the Western culture would define getting drunk. What we're dealing with is something that would conquer a symptom of sickness as Timothy was in 1 Timothy 5.23. Do you see that? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, do you guys see the huge difference between medicine for the internal, which is NyQuil, versus taking Jack Daniels for your stomach's sake? There is a huge difference between NyQuil and Jack Daniels. Huge difference. Come on. Now, let's do the third one. You see the third one? In the middle, in the middle section there. It's also called wine. It's medicine for the external. What are we dealing with right there? We are dealing with ethyl. Now, if you guys are familiar with ethyl, that's rubbing alcohol. It's, it's spelled E-T-H-Y-L. It's based upon ethanol. Okay, that's just another synonymous name for um, ethyl. It's right. It's a cleaning agent. But you don't take this internally. You take it externally. Now, this is made from rotting fruit. Now, don't mix this up with, with, uh, with methanol, which is made from which is made from propane gas and water, and it goes through a sulfuric acid process. We, guys, we are not talking about ethanol or, or methanol. We're talking about ethanol, okay, which is made from rotting fruit. Now, I had to use these three bottles in the middle for my examples. These are just examples, okay, um, to show you there is a, a distinct difference between Jack Daniels, which is made from rotting fruit that's fermented, undergoes a fermentation process, and the middle one, which is NyQuil, which undergoes a fermentation process. Now, even though Timothy took a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake, Timothy did not drink Jack Daniels or anything like it. Timothy took something that was more like a medicine for his stomach. Yeah, right. Uh, and and, and I, like I said, I'm using NyQuil as an example. You may have taken other medicines that are equal to you having alcohol in it for medicinal purposes. That's the point, okay? I'm not, I'm not using that as the exclusive, well, everybody's taking NyQuil for their stomach's sake. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm using this as an example. It's a representation of all the, the medicines that are out there that are made from rotting fruit that are used for good purposes for, for medicine, okay? So hopefully there's some understanding in that. And then, uh, like I said, in our, in our final one on, on the, on the, in the middle chart, 
are rubbing alcohol. It's used for disinfectants. It's used for cleaning wounds and, and, and things of that nature, but you're not to take it internally. And so just because you may find a verse in the Bible where they're using wine and the Bible says the word wine to be able to, to, to clean something or to, to disinfect something. It doesn't sanction people to drink Jack Daniels. It doesn't sanction people to drink wine coolers and, and all of these other, other uh, fermented drinks, okay? So, there is wine used for medicinal purposes. And we just proved that in our middle, middle chart. So, so there you go. So there's our middle chart. So we did our first one. Now, now let's just comment really quick on just we, what we already covered. We didn't even hit the last section yet. Okay, but let's just cover this because this is, this is where all the arguments come into play when, you, when you're preaching and witnessing to people out on the street or you're out at a, right by a bar, you're out outside of the bar and you're holding a sign that says Jesus saves and you're trying to pass out tracts to people. And then, and then they come out after they're half drunk and they say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine. And so there's your difference. Now you understand it. Jesus turned the water into wine and he didn't turn the water into fermented devil drink. He changed it into wine, that which is better than the human being in, in the human race has ever known. Nobody could ever know what this wine was or how it tastes or what it, what it, come on. Jesus was the only one that could make that wine. That wine is not reproduced today. And people want to go to this Jack Daniels and say, well, Jesus turned the water into wine so I can drink Jack Daniels. No, no, that is an unrighteous judgment, my friend. And I'm saying that in love. I'm saying that because I care about you. I'm saying that because maybe you come on. There, uh, you've got to say this. There is a lot of misunderstandings and teachings in churches today. There's a lot of misunderstandings by people that call themselves pastors that would condone drinking and going out to a bar and moderately drinking this stuff. And there's a misunderstanding of that thing. And as I'm not preaching here because I hate those people. I'm preaching because I want those people to know the truth. I want those people to honor God. I want those people to live their lives in a holy way that they could be pleasing to God. And that good testimony that they could have to win another lost soul to Jesus Christ. Not just because they told them that Jesus died for them. But that... Their, their lives are matching the examples of what the Bible says they ought to live. Okay? So, so that's the idea and that's the motive. Okay? So wine, Jesus turned the, the, the water into wine. And that doesn't sanction you to drink the, the middle part, the rotting fruit. Okay? Now, if it's, again, God deals in motive. If you're sick, then certainly take some medicine, even if it means the, the rotting fruit that can be used for good. Okay. So if, if you, amen, to be sober and vigilant, amen, good, good, good comment and admonition there. Amen. So, so look at our last section and then, and then we'll, we'll start with our Bible study. Look at our last section here. We have unfermented wine made from fresh fruit. It's called Welch's grape juice. That's just a, a representation of freshly squeezed Fruit juice, any fruit that's freshly squeezed in a cup, this wine you can give to your children. And it's called wine, Isaiah 65, 8. So really quick, let's do this really quick. Now, let me flip the screen here. Now, guys, when you say the word wine in the Bible, after we went through those three definitions, I mean, obviously... There were five bottles of wine on my screen, but there were only three definitions I've given. There's the, G, the, the miracle water that was turned to wine that nobody has today. Then we have the fermented fruit juice, fermented, okay? And then the third one is unfermented, unfermented. That's freshly squeezed uh, fruit juice, okay? So we got three groups right there. And they're all called wine. All three of those groups in the Bible are called wine. God labels all three of those wine in the Bible. What we have to do 
is be responsible and have integrity in the scriptures. And whenever we read the word wine in the Bible, we need to make sure we read the context. We get the whole chapter and what it's saying, who is writing it, who are they writing it to, why are they writing it, for what purpose is they writing it, where's Jesus in the passage, where is God in the passage, where is where's the admonition in the passage. We need to understand the historical context, the practical context, and the spiritual context. Okay, so now... Now that we have an understanding of these three definitions of wine in the Bible and that we don't use the word wine subjectively, but we use the word wine objectively by saying, whenever somebody says the word wine, we say, well, what do you mean by wine? Are we talking unfermented? Are we talking fermented? Or are we talking the stuff that Jesus turned the water into? That's come on. That's three. Because what Jesus turned the water into, he didn't turn the water into uh, the, the freshly squeezed stuff. Jesus didn't squeeze any grapes in, in, in a cup. <laughs> Jesus turned the water into wine. That's, so, that's, a, that's a miracle. Whatever that, whatever that wine was, we can't explain it. And we have no way of reproducing that today. So to say that I can drink wine because Jesus turned the water into wine is completely absurd. It's completely unlearned uh, um, according to your knowledge of the scriptures, okay? So we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is believe the Bible for what it actually teaches and what it actually says. I don't need to twist the scriptures to make it say what I want it to say. I don't need to go to the Greek and I don't need to go to the Hebrew. All you need, my friend, is the trustworthy good old King James Bible, and you can believe that and trust that every word of God is pure, and we can believe it for what it actually says, because God said he would preserve his word, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, and we're going to believe God at his word. Come on, if God can preserve your salvation, the salvation of your soul, certainly God can preserve his word. <laughs> okay, guys, so let's go ahead and get started on this thing. Um, let, let me clear this up right here and then I'll, we'll, we'll get into this Romans 13 cause that's where we're at, uh, Romans overview series. So let's go ahead and flip the screen and I'll show you our, uh, prereq prerequisite for our, you know, proposition of drunkenness here. And then we'll dive right into the study. Okay. So here we go. Let me uh, get to the Bible. There it is. Now. Let's start in verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. Sounds pretty crystal clear to me, but people want to avoid these passages of scriptures because they don't fit right in society. They don't fit right with their carnal Christian friends. They don't fit right with their family because if your whole family is drinking in moderation, then by you saying, mom, dad, uh, sister, brother, we're not supposed to be drinking any of that. The Bible says in Romans 13, oh, don't be giving me this Bible. Come on, close that book. You don't understand that Bible. Leave that to the pastors. Leave that to the men of God. I mean, come on, we can drink a little bit. And you, you see, see the problem there? There's a problem. And the problem is there is no understanding of sanctification and holiness according to God for the Christian life. People think that once you're saved by grace through faith, you can live however you want. And Romans 6 gives you the rebuke. Come on, we're not saved that we can use grace as the license to sin. We're not saved so we can just live however way we wanted to live when we were lost. Come on, you're not saved to live a life as a lost man. You're not saved to live a life in carnality. You are saved to be sanctified under the Lord, to be able to live eternal life. Come on, eternal life don't start when you die. Eternal life started the moment you were born again. That's when, that's when eternal life starts. It starts now. And the Bible says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, 
Here's the problem. When I say put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that, well, you're trying to say that I'm not saved. And for me to be able to be saved, I got to stop drinking and then put on Jesus. And then that way I, I can maintain my salvation. But if I start being a drunk again, then, then I've took, taken off the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not what it's saying. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ is in cross reference to being renewed in his spirit day by day. If I'm not renewed one day in the spirit because I want to live my life in sin, I don't lose my salvation. I, I am forever sanctified by my soul from the penalty of sin forever. Now, what I have to worry about right now is my spirit and my body. Come on, that's the flesh and the spirit. That's what I got to worry about right now. My soul is saved forever from the penalty of sin. Jesus Christ has paid it all. Now, what I got to deal with every day, that's why the Bible says I need to be sanctified every day. I need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ every day. I need to not make provision for the flesh every day. I don't need to be fulfilling the lust thereof every day because there's a possibility I can put off the Lord Jesus Christ and still be saved. There's a way that I could make provision for the flesh and still be saved. There's a way I could fulfill the lust thereof and still be saved. But the Bible says I shouldn't. I shouldn't live my life that way. Now look what it says in verse 13. It says, let us walk honestly as in the day. It's as clear as day that I should walk honestly. So what does that mean according to drunkenness and wine and alcohol? It means that it, if I'm walking honestly, I am not even taking a sip of beer. I'm not even trying it. I'm not tasting it. I'm not trying to provoke other people to try it. I'm not trying to provoke other people to taste it because I'm walking honestly as in the day. It's as clear as day. When somebody looks at me, they say, wow, that guy doesn't even touch a drop of alcohol. That guy doesn't even tr touch a drop of beer. He doesn't even look upon the wine when it is red. He doesn't even look upon the color of it. And that's the testimony we ought to have. Abstain from the appearance of evil. We ought to be sanctified to the Lord every day of our lives, not just Sunday on one day to please the pastor and the, and the church members that are around you. And then when you leave home, you head for home on Super Bowl Sunday and you break out the six pack. Are you serious? That is not Christianity, my friend. You might be saved, but you're not a Christian. A Christian is means Christ-like. It means you're going to follow as close as you can to Jesus Christ's example. And Jesus was sanctified. He was sanctified for his Father's will. To do all things that please the Father. And if we are to be like Jesus Christ, should we not be sanctified as much as we can to yield to the Bible as much as we can and not give anybody the shadow of a doubt to question our testimony? Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going to provoke you unto good works. I'm going to provoke you unto righteousness. I'm going to provoke you unto a sanctified life for Jesus Christ. That's what I'm going to do. You're not going to hear me condoning to, well, you know, you're my, you're my best friend. And, and I know you mean, well, go ahead and drink. You know, I mean, a, a little bit of drink ain't going to hurt you. And, you know, Timothy drank a little wine for his stomach's sake. Jesus turned the water into wine. You ain't going to, you ain't getting that on my scope, my friend. What you're going to get is rightly divided Bible verses, and we're going to get the context. We're going to get verse by verse context, and we're going to see if that's what it really says. Because if you're taking a little wine for your stomach, it's for infirmity, my friend. And you, and you ain't drinking Jack Daniels for the infirmity of your stomach. You're going to be taking some medicine for that. You're not taking no Jack Daniels, no wine coolers and all that. Come on. Honesty and integrity in the scriptures. That's what we're going to have on KJV Bible Scope. All right. So now that we did this opening, amen, we can get into our Bible study here. So uh, we left off. We conquered in more detail the three definitions of wine in the Bible. And we hit the verses on the prior scopes. And now we want to start off with Luke 115 here. So let's go to Luke 115. Now let's read what it says. Let's get some context here. Let's go back. Uh, and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, fear not Zacharias for thy prayer is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son and thou shalt call his name John and shalt 
and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither what? Wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Do you want to know a great example and practical application of Ephesians 5.18? <laughs> be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be ye filled with the spirit right there. There's your, there's your example for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. What makes a person great in Luke 1 15? What? Come on. What makes a person great in the sight of the Lord in Luke 1 15? Not drinking wine nor strong drink. That's not even taking a sip, my friend, not even tasting it. And why would you look upon it? Turn your eyes away. Come on, guys, you can't avoid uh, all of the ads that you get when you go out to the stores. You can't avoid all the all the, the, the jargon and the talk people have if you're out and about and you got you got uh, lost people out there. You got lost people on your job and you got all these advertisements and all that you're playing the radio and you hear it all. Guys, the only thing you can do is cast down every imagination that exalted itself against God and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all you can do is when something is flashing you in your face is to turn your eyes away. That's all you can do. In clear conscience, that's all you can do is make sure that you're controlling yourself, that you're being temperate in all things, and that there are, there are some things that we can't avoid. I understand that. You got to go to work. You got to make a living. You got to deal with lost people. You got to deal with people's uh, slogans on their shirts. You got to deal with sometimes the, the, the workplace is playing loud music that you don't want to hear that's dishonoring to God. I understand you got to hear all those things, but... You can certainly control your mind. You can certainly control on what you look at. You can certainly control in what you dwell upon. Okay? That's what we're saying. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And the thing that made him great was not drinking wine nor strong drink. And look, look at what else made him great. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. Guys, it's either or. Guys, it didn't say he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. And he shall... He shall drink in moderation wine and strong drink and he shall be filled with the holy ghost guys you're either filled with wine or strong drink or you're filled with the holy ghost you can't be filled with both somebody lied to you somebody's deceiving you somebody's messing with your inheritance galatians chapter 5 you better be careful friend be careful who's teaching you the bible be careful who's who's Quoting these verses to you out of context, what you need is rightly dividing the word of truth. And the only way you're going to know if your pastor, or your preacher is preaching the word of God is when you're studying the word of God for yourself and you're able to say, wait a minute, pastor, you can't say it's okay to moderately drink. The Bible exclusively forbids, explicitly forbids it. The justifications that you're giving are wrong. They're wrongly divided. What you need, Pastor, is, is, is let's just talk alone. I don't want to embarrass you. Let's go, let's go to a, a room and talk alone. I don't, I don't want to call you out in front of your congregation, but we got to talk. And then you talk to him alone and you let him know the concerns. Now, when he says, I don't care, I'm going to preach it this way because if I don't, I'm going to lose congregational members. I'm going to lose tithe money. I'm going to, I'm going to lose that flow of money coming in. My friend, you better know when to say when. What's the authority in the church? Is it the pastor or is it the holy word of God? Friend, you better get that thing right. You better be a true Christian. You better leave that church if, there, if the Bible's not the final authority. You better go to a church that's a Bible-believing church and submit yourself to that church because the Bible's the word of God, not your pastor. The Bible's the word of God, not your deacons, not your priests, not your gurus. All right, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that in love. I'm saying that, I'm, I'm saying that because I care, okay? Now, I'm just an internet preacher. I don't have a congregation. But I can tell you this, if I was submitted to a man and he didn't submit to the Bible, I would talk to him alone. And I'd ask him why. Why did you not preach this thing the right way? I wouldn't embarrass him. 
I would talk to him alone and I'd, I'd tell him my concerns. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be prideful. I'd, I'd say, I'd come in a humble spirit and I'd ask him, you know, hey, you know I'm really concerned about this. You know, I, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be judgmental. All I'm trying to do is tell you the word of God explicitly states wine and strong drink is forbidden. We are not to even look upon it when it is red. We are not to look upon its color. And how can you teach somebody to drink even in moderation? That's wicked. And I'm not saying that to be mean to you, pastor. It's wicked according to what the word of God says about it. Whatever's not holy. Come on. If, if you're going to take what God says, I'm going to put difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, Leviticus 10, then whatever's unholy is wicked. Now, I don't want you to live in wickedness, Mr. Pastor. I don't want you to, to teach these people that you're, excuse me, that God has commissioned you to be in charge of, to teach them the wrong way because you want to hold on to a few people in a congregation because they're paying you tithe money and they're paying your salary. They're paying your bills. You better teach the word of God even if, even if everybody leaves your church. Friend, what you, who you're trying to reach are people that want truth. Even if you only got two people watching you, even if you got two people coming to your church, if you got one person there, even if it's just your family and nobody's in the pews, you got a church that can house 500 people and nobody's there because you're preaching the truth, then so be it. But you know what? There's one thing that you are doing, my friend. You are honoring God. You are honoring God. Just as Jeremiah did when none of the nation of Israel wanted to listen to him. He preached to them and he preached to them and he preached to them and he didn't, and he didn't want to hear it. And so he preached to them and he preached to them and they didn't want to hear it. You say, well, if you don't have any people following you, then you must be doing something wrong. On the contrary, my friend, if nobody's following me, it means those people didn't want truth. Guys, that's the difference. I'm not saying that with a mean, hateful spirit. I'm saying that because I care about people. I want people to want truth, but I can't make people want truth, guys. All I can do is get on the scope and preach the truth to people, read the Bible verse by verse, and people, people are going to be on the scope. They're going to want to hear it because they're going to want truth. They're going to want the Bible. Or just like in the days of Hosea and Jeremiah, just like in the days of David, people are going to turn their backs on the truth. And it doesn't matter how many turn their backs on the truth. Truth is truth no matter how many people turn their backs on it. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with the preacher. It means there's something wrong with the people that don't want truth. See, people look at my scopes. They say, you only have a few followers, brother Ed. Well, that's fine with me. Because the people that, that are on watching me, believe me, these are people that want truth. And the Bible says straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So the argument is flawed to say because you have a lot of people following you, that must make you right. On the contrary, the Bible says there's only a few people that are going to trust in the right way. So guys, what we need to do is those that want truth, we need to look at objective truth in the Bible because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You could deceive yourselves till the cows come home, but truth is truth no matter how you slice it, okay? So there you go. So what we have is a difference between wine and strong drink, being filled with it, and being filled with the, with the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. Okay? Now, I want you to notice something here before we move on, okay? Because I definitely wanted to move on to this next controversial passage that people like to give to sanctioned drinking, okay? So here, let's just do this one first. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Notice what it doesn't say right there. It doesn't say, and shall drink neither in excess wine nor strong drink see notice the word excess is not present in the passage but what is everybody's argument in ephesians 5 18 well you can drink in moderation just as long as it's not in excess well luke 1 15 my friend the only way to be great is to neither drink wine nor strong drink and it's not even a, a sanctioned out as a moderate uh amount <laughs> Okay, so don't drink it at all, at all. There you go. Amen. That's, come on, you're going to get Bible on here, guys. Okay, so let's keep going. 
So we did that one. It doesn't say excess there. So that destroys the excess argument. Okay, so is it okay? Now, now here, here it is. This, this is what we've all been waiting for in the past six scopes on wine that I've done already. Um, here it is, guys. You've been waiting for this one. Well, doesn't the Bible say... Here, look, you, you, come on. You got to see some reaction here. You got to see some expression. Doesn't the Bible say to that you that, that you can drink? There's verses in the Bible that sanction you can drink. And I mean strong drink. Okay, let's do it. Okay, you guys ready? Let's do it. Let's hit the one verse that people say are many verses. They take one verse and they say, because one verse sanctions drinking, they say, well, it's all over the Bible. You know what people do? You know what people do? They, 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 they think there's, because there's one verse that says something that they don't even understand the verse. But they say because one verse says what they think it says, that the Bible's it's all over the Bible. The Bible says you can drink. It's all over the Bible. <laughs> okay, guys, let's conquer that one passage that people struggle with. Okay, Proverbs 31. Here it is. I know you guys are waiting for this one. Proverbs 31, 6 and 7. Mainly six, okay, because we don't need seven, because uh, six pretty much says what we want it to say, because what do we want to do with verse six? Let's read it first, and then I'll, I'll show you what people want to do with it. Let's flip the screen here. Give strong drink. Give strong drink. Does it say give, Brother Ed? Yes, it says give. Does it say strong drink, Brother Ed? Yes, it says strong drink. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. See, the Bible sanctions drinking. It says it all over the place. Now, just in verse six of Proverbs 31. Um, no, it's all over the place. <laughs> okay, so Proverbs 31, six is your sanction, right? To drink, right? Correct? Okay, you guys ready for this? I'm telling you guys, this is, this is a real pet peeve of mine. Here's what I don't want you to do, but yet people do it anyways. Here, look, look, look at the screen right there. You see, look, look right. Let's try to point down here. Point down, point down. Right there. Can you see that? Right there. It's called cherry picking. Um, stop cherry picking. Stop doing it. it. That's a real pet peeve of mine. I don't want you to do it, but this is, this is the 99.9% the .9 of reasoning that people have is to cherry pick one verse and because they think the verse says what it says that that condones them to drink wine that condones them not to believe the bible that condones them to make to, to, the, the verses to make god a sinner now i say verse the cherry picked verse don't cherry pick okay there you go I, I made that just for you okay i i designed that just for you so people would know not to cherry pick <laughs> is it going to look, is it going to stop people from cherry picking? Obviously not, <laughs> but sometimes having a visual there of cherry picking is, is a good thing. I mean, people know that that's possible. People do do that. So let's hit Proverbs 31, six, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now, let me tell you this. The first time I ever heard that argument was in a Bible college that I went to that I ended up, I was only there for a year and then I got out because they were, they were compromising the word of God. And, um, I didn't want to be taught by people that didn't believe the, the King James Bible. So I left, I dropped all my classes and I waited there and I paid off my tuition and then I left. Okay. And then I went to a place that believed the Bible, which was the place where I'm at now. Um, the Bible Baptist church here in the land. Okay. And, um, I'm manager here at the Bible Baptist church and, uh, praise the Lord. It's a, they believe the Bible. <laughs> so, I mean, it's everything that I could ever dream for in a church, a church that actually believes the Bible. That's a, that's ain't that a novel idea. So let's hit this thing. So the first time I ever heard this argument was at that Bible college. And a girl, we were covering the topic of wine and a girl raised her hand in class. And, um, he, this guy was preaching hard against drinking one drop of wine. And, um, I was, I was happy that he's doing that, but it was too bad. They couldn't stand in the word of God on all the, the doctrines of the Bible, but they, they fell on their faces and a lot of things, but at least on wine, you know, they were pretty, pretty much sound in the wine argument. They actually didn't sanction even one drop. 
and told Christians, don't even, don't even look upon it. And then, so this girl raises her hand and she says, um, Hey, you know, so-and-so, uh, teacher, so-and-so, I got a question. And, and then he's like, what? And then, so she quotes him, Proverbs 31, six says, well, what do you do about, uh, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine to those that be of heavy hearts. What do you do about that one? And so she said it, I mean, you can tell that she was trying to present it humbly, but there was a, there was some pride there. There was some pride there. Cause it was like, well, you know, well what do you do about that one? You know? <laughs> so, so pretty much. And, and, and again, even today, when you go on the street and you deal with anybody that has any knowledge or carnal knowledge of scriptures, they'll quote something like Proverbs 31, six to you to sanction drinking. Now let's do this. Okay. Let's do that. We're going to conquer this. Now give strong drink unto him. That is what that is what ready to perish. Okay, let's do it. Let me ask the question first before I flip the screen. We're going to give some verses for this. Are you ready to perish? Are you ready to perish? Are you in poverty? Are you in misery? Now, now let's flip the screen. I'll show you the rest of the verse. Now look at this. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. So my question to you was, are you ready to perish? Number one. Number two, are you of a heavy heart? Number three, are you in poverty? Number four, are you in misery? Now a lost man has no hope and may choose strong drink to fill the void but why would a saved man practice what a lost man practices? Now, 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 here we go. Perish. Are you ready to perish? If you're saved today, look what it says in John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Are you ready to perish as a saved member of the body of Christ? I'm never going to perish. What about you? So your argument about give strong drink and wine unto them that are going to perish, that doesn't apply to you, my friend. You have no sanction to drink wine or strong drink. Let's do another one. So perish. Well, you're not one of the ones that are going to perish if you're saved by the, by the blood of Christ. Come on. You give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish. We're not ready to perish. We've got eternal life right now. Okay, now look at, look, at the, look at the next half. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now let's do that one. A heavy heart. Why would I have a heavy heart if I have the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? A heavy heart? Or is it love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against that such there is no law? Wait a minute. I've got more. I've got more joy. I've got more peace. I've got more uh, life and, 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 and a quality of life to live than to sit here and drink with those that are ready to perish that be of heavy hearts. See that? That be of heavy hearts. Are you of a heavy heart today? Well, if you're dying in your sins and you don't have a savior, that would be excuse to have a heavy heart. That would be an excuse to get into the wine. See, Guys, lost people are already doing these things. But saved people don't need to be engaging in what lost people are doing. See, strong drink is for those that are lost, that are ready to perish. Wine is for those that be of heavy hearts because they know that their soul has no hope. But we're not of those that have no hope. All right, guys, let's keep going. So we did uh, give strong drink that's ready to perish. You're not ready to perish and wine into those that be of heavy hearts. You're not of heavy hearts. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. No, no, no guys. Look what we have also for heavy hearts. We don't have it. Look whom, whom having not seen ye love. Let, come on, let's go back. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than, than of gold that perishes. See, we're not going to perish, but we're look, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Amen. Whom having not seen ye love, 
in whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with what with what heavy hearts come on guys are we rejoicing with heavy hearts okay give me a beer give me that jack daniels i got a heavy heart because one day i'm going to see my savior one day i'm going to see see the one who loves me enough who died for my no I'm going to see my Savior, and I have joy unspeakable and full of glory. How, Guys, to use the argument of Proverbs is foolish. You are not of a heavy heart. You, we rejoice in joy unspeakable and full of glory. There, Look, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, I've got no reason to be of a heavy heart. So who's going to be getting wine and strong drink? Is it going to be me or is it going to be the lost person? Well, more likely the lost person because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit to be filled in. He doesn't have Jesus Christ that lives within him. He doesn't have God the Father, Ephesians 4, that lives within him. He doesn't have the whole glory of God, the triune God living within him. What, is, what does all he, come on, all he has is an empty void. And what does he try to fill that void with? Booze, liquor, and vice. That's all he has. And so what is he going to do? He's going to fill his life with more emptiness, with more vanity. And guys, we are not living that life. Why would you go to Proverbs? Why would you go to that passage to promote drinking? You're as a lost person trying to, trying to justify that you're saved as you're trying to live amongst lost people and trying to show that you're no different from them as you're justifying their lifestyle instead of justifying the lifestyle you ought to live in holiness for Jesus Christ. Guys, I say that because I love you. I, I, I say that because I, I raise my voice. People think I'm hateful and mean. I say that because I care about you. I say that because I love you. And if you're saved today, you ought to love Jesus Christ enough to say, this is the Bible. This is what makes sense. This is what's appealing to my the pricking in my soul that says this is right. I need to honor God in my body and my spirit, which are God's. There you go, guys. That, that's, that, that's the teaching right there. Look, we're not going to perish. We're not of heavy hearts. Now, let's cover the poverty. Let's go back to Proverbs and look at the poverty. Look, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Guys, are you trying to forget your poverty? Come on, you want to use Proverbs 31, 6 as your justification for, for, for doing drinking and, and everything while you're in Christ? Come on, you're, what poverty are you trying to forget? Okay, let's do it. Poverty. Christ has made me rich through his poverty. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. What poverty could you possibly have to turn to a bottle of beer? What poverty could you possibly be suffering right now to say that my life is empty and void, that I'm in Christ and I have nothing to live for? Christ did not save you to, to be more empty than you were before you were saved, when you got saved. You're not empty, my friend. You got Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you want to walk around and say, well, I'm going to justify my drinking with Proverbs. Okay, guys, that's, see, that's the problem. Proverbs 31, 6 does not justify your drinking. It's condemning your drinking. It's on the contrary. It's condemning you. What you need to do, friend, instead of, instead of getting more prideful and saying, well, well, there's something in the Bible that I can go to, that I can reach for, that can justify me drinking. Inst guys, instead of doing that, why don't you respond to the clear passages of Scripture that, that say there is no sanction at all to even drink it, taste it, look at it, and turn from that wickedness, turn from that sin and humble yourself. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You're not going to be lifted by booze, liquor, and vice. You're not going to be lifted by that Bacardi. You're not going to be lifted up by that New Year's celebration as you're drinking all that beer with your friends. You know how you're going to get lifted? 
When you humble yourself towards God and you humble yourself towards the mighty word of God and you say, I agree with this. I'm going to humble myself. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to, he's going to lift you up in such a way that wine could never do. He's going to lift you up in such a way that you're going to know, you're going to know that this was the right thing to do. But the problem is you don't even want to try it out. You don't want to even say, wait a minute, let me, let me study this thing out. Let me read all the passages of scripture. Let me hear the matter out. You know what you're going to do? You're going to hear a two, ver two, two words that I say on a scope. Oh, drink alcohol or no drink alcohol. Come on. I, I got asked that yesterday on the scope. You, you, you know, this guy, this, this guy got on the scope. He says, alcohol, yes or no? When I said no, he got off the scope. You know why? Because it's not about, the, guys, this is KJV Bible scope. This isn't KJV heart scope. This guys, this isn't KJV your opinion scope. This isn't KJV raise your hand and tell me what Oprah Winfrey said scope. This, guys, this is KJV Bible scope. We're gonna go to the Bible. We're gonna believe what the Bible teaches, not what your heart says, not what you grew up with, or what your mom and dad have always taught you. We're gonna go with the Bible, okay? That's the difference. All right, so we did. What did we do already? We did. Okay, we did perish. We did heavy heart. We did poverty. Now let's do misery. Come on. Let's read it in Proverbs to show uh, about the misery, about the drinking, the strong drink. Now, now here we go. Let's flip the screen here. Now look at this. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty. Now what else? What else? And remember his misery no more. What kind of misery do you got? <laughs> are, are, guys, are you telling me that you got saved and now you're living in misery? <laughs> Did you guys not read as much as Galatians 5, 22 and 23 that we just read? Come on, joy, long suffering and peace. Parts of the fruits of the spirit. We've got joy unspeakable. How are you in misery? <laughs> Guys, it blows my mind when people use these verses to justify their drinking. But they do, right? Come on. They're going to justify their drinking no matter what. Guys, people don't care what the Bible says. A am I saying all people? No, I I'm, I'm speaking in general. Most people are not going to care what the Bible says. They're going to keep doing what they've always been doing. They're going to live how they always lived. I mean, we're talking about carnal Christians today. We're talking about lost people who don't want to get saved. And, and that, that, it's pretty much that. They're the captain of their own salvation. They're the captain of their own destiny. That's what they believe. And they're deceiving themselves. But guys, but we as Bible believers don't see it that way. We as Bible believers appeal to what we call the Bible. And in this Bible that we appeal to, we believe every word of God, not just the parts we love to, to cherry pick out of the Bible. Do you believe in the Old Testament, brother? Ed? Yes, I believe in the Old Testament. Oh, well, if you believe in the Old Testament, yeah, that's pretty wicked. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're a sinner. What do you mean? We're all sinners. That's the point. The Old Testament shows how sinful not only Gentiles were, but it shows how sinful God's chosen people were, the nation of Israel. And God had to sit there and judge his own chosen people because they chose carnality over living a holy, sanctified life for him. God gave them some weird laws to live by. God gave them some laws to say, look, I'm giving you these weird laws. <laughs> Come on, tassels on the clothes, really? He's uh, trimming the corners of your beards, not eating shrimp. Come on, these are all just things to make Israel different from all the other nations. And God was just giving them these laws to see if they really loved him, to see if they'd really obey it. And you know what he found? It was worse than he could have ever expected, right? Come on, it was worse than God had ever expected. God didn't want to judge his people. God didn't want to judge the nation of Israel. God didn't want to kill his own people. But those own people deserve the death penalty when they violated the law that they were warned about and they still violated it. Okay, the, uh, in our laws today, it says don't kill people, right? Are, are you going to go around and kill people and expect the, the, the government to not come in and, and send police out to arrest you? And then you're going to say, well, the government's wicked. It's maniacal. They, man, the government takes you and they throw you in jail and then they want to give you the death penalty, man. 
as you miss out on the vital information about, well, why are they killing you? Why are they putting you in prison? Because you killed a bunch of people. <laughs> it's the ridiculous arguments that atheists and agnostics give about the Old Testament, okay? They have no understanding of the Old Testament. They sit there, they try to read it and cherry pick verses like I told you they do. And then what they do is they make it say what they want it to say as to condemn God and then ultimately condemning you for believing in this God that they don't understand, that they have, have never really truly read the Bible. Okay, I know I made a little pit stop there. I think it was important and, and needed to be said. So let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Guys, you're not in misery anymore the moment you're saved. So what is sanctioning you by the attributes of perishing, heavy hearts, poverty, and misery? What is sanctioning you out of those four attributes to say, I can go ahead and drink strong drink? Nothing. Nothing. Look at verse 8. Here's what I'm doing with those people that want to sanction drinking. I'm going to open my mouth for the dumb in the cause of all as such are appointed to destruction. Look, open thy mouth, judge righteously. Well, the Bible says don't judge. It says thou shalt not judge. Well, what does Proverbs 31, 9 says? Open thy mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. I'm the judge. Come on. Here's the problem. Those verses like Matthew 7, you don't understand those verses. Don't quote those verses if you don't know what they mean. <laughs> Thou shalt not judge. I don't care what you say. Exactly. Of, of course you don't care what I say. Because I'm going to give you rightly divided Bible. Now, now Matthew 7 is dealing with a hypocrite. And the Bible don't say judge. Judge. Least ye be judged. It doesn't say that. That's why you need a King James Bible. The Bible says, judge that ye be not judged. So I'm not supposed to judge in a way that I could be judged myself for that same offense. But how am I to judge? I'm the judge where there's not a moat in my eye. And I am the judge in such a way that I can take the beam out of your eye. And it's justified because I don't have a moat in my eye. That's how you judge righteously. Let me give you an example of that really quick since we made a pit stop here, okay? Let, let, let's give a quick example, okay? Now, the Bible says for me to judge righteously. How do I judge righteously? Well, I can go out to the street and I can yell Jesus saves to a bunch of drunks. I can yell Jesus saves to a bunch of people going to a football game. I can yell Jesus saves those going to an art festival. I can yell Jesus saves to any group or any group of people that's out there because I'm telling them that Jesus Christ can save them. And what would be a hypocritical thing for me to do? It would be hypocritical for me to yell out Jesus saves if I'm not saved myself. If I say you're going to hell if you don't trust Jesus and I'm not saved myself, that's a hypocrite. I'm under the condemnation of Matthew 7. Judge not that ye be not judged. I'm judging, but these people can judge me. What are you telling us this for? You're not even saved. Don't tell us to get saved if you're not saved yourself. Okay, let me give you another example. What, what if I'm a carnal Christian at a bar and I'm drinking I'm drinking a beer with, with, with the, these other guys that I'm trying to witness to. I'm saying, well, yeah, you know, to the drunks, I became as drunk that I might win the drunks. As you twist that verse up to try to justify you going to the bar to drink with drunks. And then you say, well, I'm trying to win the drunks because I'm in the bar with them and I'm being trying to be the best testimony I can be as I'm getting drunk with them, going home and fornicating with women like they are. No, guys, you ain't winning those people that way. You ain't winning them. Okay, here's what we call a hypocrite. Now, this is the judgment that we're talking about, okay? This is the kind of judgment that's unrighteous judgment. This is the kind of judgment that people are doing that you can quote Matthew 7 on, okay? Here's, well, here would be a correct one. When you go into the bar, instead of attacking the preachers on the street that are telling these people in the bar that they need to trust Jesus to be saved, they're not telling them to stop drinking. They're telling them to get saved. And instead of attacking the preachers on the street, why don't you go to that bar, the people coming out of that bar that claim to be Christians, and tell them, wait a minute, why are you in that bar? 
Weren't you just telling that guy over there about Jesus? Yeah, I was telling him. That's a hypocritical. You can't tell that guy about Jesus as you're drinking in the bar with him. You can't tell that guy to stop drinking as you're drinking with him. Now you're using Matthew 7 correctly. Guys, it's, it's frustrating how people don't know those verses and how every time I go out to the street, every time I do some street preaching, every time I witness the gospel of Jesus Christ, I got to deal with Jesus turn the water into wine. I got to deal with, you know, thou shalt not judge. I got to deal with, you know, Jesus says, you know, he, he drank with the wine bibbers and he was, he was with them. Really? Really? All right, let's look, let's keep going. I, I, I needed to make that pit stop. This stuff needs to be said. It's practical teaching on, on the basis of what we're teaching right now, okay? So, open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So, the Bible tells us to judge righteously. Now, I'm looking at these drunks that are ready to perish. I'm looking at, now, now do I know if who's ready to perish and who's not? No, I don't. I assume everybody lost until somebody confesses to me a testimony or tells me, Hey, you know, I'm, you know, I, I was thinking about trusting Jesus or, Hey, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't believe like you do or this or that. So, so we go out there and assume everybody lost and hope that when we preach the gospel, those that need to get saved will come up to us and talk to us and, and, try to ask us questions so we can converse with them and give them the gospel witness and the gospel testimony. Okay. So that's kind of the idea. So give strong drink on him that ready is, is ready to perish. Nobody needs to be giving strong drink to a Christian. He's not ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Nobody needs to give strong drink to be to anybody. That's, that's a Christian because they're not of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty. You don't need to be drinking anything to forget poverty because you're not in poverty. You've got the riches and glory of Christ Jesus. And remember his misery no more. You have no misery, my friend. You have peace with God. So what are the sanctions of Proverbs 31, 6 to drink? Zero. None. Now, I hope if you're an open-minded person today, that you would consider what we just went through. That's that's Bible. We just went through Bible. We we didn't give any opinions in there. I mean, obviously, we, we got some, some practical preaching and teaching according to the principles, but no opinion. We, we got Bible. We got Bible for everything we said. Okay? So, so there you go. There you go. So we did it. We conquered Proverbs 31, 6, and 7. No problem. No problem. Do you still think that sanctions drinking? And with a little bit of learning, you got to say, no, that doesn't sanction drinking. So show me the other verse. Where's the other verse you say that we can drink? There you go. And again, we got about, you know, 30, 40 pages of study material here. You, you can't possibly give me a verse that I haven't heard yet. Okay. So, I mean, again, I'm not going to, guys, it's not going to be a conclusive study, but we're definitely going to get um, really close to it because I've got a lot of notes on this wine topic. And I mean, there is, there's, there is no, I mean, there's not, there's not even a grain of thought in my mind that says there might be some sanction to drink a little bit. There, there's none at all. None at all. So guys, be persuaded by the scriptures, not by your opinion, not by the, the, the bulk of mainline Christianity. Be persuaded by the scriptures. I mean, all the Israelites in Jeremiah's day were going a different direction than Jeremiah. So should Jeremiah have turned his back on God and followed the Israelites? Because even the priests were going that direction, right? Come on. The Levites were headed the same direction as the nation of Israel in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah was the only one standing. So all the religious people go the same direction as the congregation. So you're going to follow them or are you going to follow God? Even if you're the only one. Let's, let's be the, let's be of the people like Jeremiah. Let's be of the people like Ezekiel. Let's be of the people like Hosea. And let's, even though that's old Testament, they stood for God. They stood for truth. They tried to witness to God's people and the God's people didn't even want it. And so today God's people don't want the word of God. We, 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 we preach sanctification. We preach holiness. And you know, people say, yeah, 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 yeah. I believe that dude. I believe just like you do. 
wait, 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 stop drinking? Oh, no. No, you mean, you mean just don't get drunk. Like, drink excessively one, one beer after another. No, 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 no. We can drink moderately like at a New Year's party or a wedding. No. Stop defiling yourself. Stop defiling you. Stop quenching the Holy Ghost. He lives within you. Your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You have of God. You are not your own. You, come on. Every time these people argue with me about the wine, they say, well, I don't see it that way. Well, I feel, no, no. You know what the problem is? It's you still think you're your own if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, of course you're your own. Until you die, then your spirit goes back to God and your, your body is worm food and your soul goes to hell. If you haven't trusted Christ. See, so you're still not your own. But right now, you've got a free will. You can choose to do whatever you want. Are you saved today? You can choose to do whatever you want. You can live for Christ. You can turn your back on him. It's not going to change the state of your salvation, the, the, the state of your soul, that Jesus saved you from the penalty of sin concerning your soul. That's, that's, that's already imputed to you. You can't lose that if you want to. What the problem is, is your spirit and your body. Destruction for the flesh. Destruction for the spirit. Grieving the spirit, guys. I mean, you're going to end up living a short life. I don't want to see that for anybody. But you're going to live a short life. You're going to live a life of no peace. You're going to live a life of just rebellion to God. And what you're going to find is emptiness. You'll be like, well, how can you still have emptiness if you have Christ? When you turn your back on Jesus Christ, all there is is emptiness out there. All you're doing is going right back to that lost lifestyle. I didn't say, the, guys, you can't go back to being lost again. But you can certainly go back to the lifestyle. Don't do it. You got so much better in Christ. You got so much better lifestyle in Christ. Why would you avoid that? Why would you not want to even live that? But people don't. All right, guys. So here we go. Let's, I don't know if we can cover this next section. I think, I think we, I think we covered what we needed to. We did uh, poverty. We did misery heavy heart perish. And so we did all that Proverbs 31, six to seven. And then, um, let me see. Yeah. What I'll do is we'll save. We're going to save this, this, uh, this other half that I want to do, uh, for tomorrow, Lord willing. And, um, I think we even covered, uh, we, we, we covered some of this already. I don't think I want to recover it. I think we, we kind of wore it out. Um, but there is a little section that I did. I definitely did want to give you guys um, that I that I separated out. And I don't have it on the screen right now. So here's what we'll do. Um, yeah, we'll try to do this tomorrow, Lord willing. I went through a service today. Um, it was a great message on chastisement, and I, I, I thought it was a huge blessing to me. Um, and so I, I figured, you know, I didn't give you guys a Bible scope today. And for those that um, can't watch on YouTube, at least, you know, you, you can at least watch uh, this scope on wine. And you can see, you know, some of the, the sanctification messages that we give and everything. So, um, Lord willing, that was a blessing to you. I hope that you guys, uh, go back and watch the whole wine study. I even changed the cover on YouTube for the wine study. So, you know, where the wine study actually starts on the uh, series of the Romans overview where wine starts, uh, you know, when I start preaching it, so you can actually see the whole study or hear the whole study. Okay. So I hope that'll be a blessing to you. I'll probably re re upload this to YouTube, uh, tonight or tomorrow. Um, guys, thank you for joining me on this KJV Bible scope. Uh, I hope that these are a blessing to you. And, uh, I hope that you guys have a, a great and wonderful evening.